Okay, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and kick this off with showing you the um, agenda slide. This is just to go over what we're going to discuss and what we'll be showing you today. Um, so really quickly, uh, you know, this is the faculty training session here. Um, and just so you know, we're going to have two more of these in August because we know a lot of faculty is returning um, from vacations and time off and so forth and course planning and stuff like that. So we also know that quarters and semesters will be beginning for the most part in August. And uh, August 23rd would be a little too late for, for a large amount of um, people. So for that reason, we'll have two sessions in August. The, the next session will be August uh, 9th. And then another session after that will be August 23rd. So, so just so you know, there'll be emails about those um, and registrations for those as well. And then after that, this uh, webinar will be on a monthly cadence. So usually the third or fourth Tuesday of every month, we'll be doing this on a monthly basis. Okay, so today we're gonna cover logging into your instance. We're going to talk about what the App Store access is all about what that collection of uh, icons really mean and, and things like that. We'll talk a little bit about file handling and file recovery because I think this is something that's pretty important. Um, since some of you might know, our user profiles are somewhat persistent. So that means that data is really important in how it's stored. Also, we'll be talking about uh, the virtual classroom and presenter mode features that we have. And after that, we'll kind of show a little bit about the LMS integration. So things like Canvas, Blackboard, Brightspace, uh, and so forth. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, admin management, if we can squeeze that in. And then I'd like to make sure that we have time for Q&A as well. So we'll try to cover all these topics and then give you the opportunity to um, ask questions and have us answer them for you. Now, there's a Q&A section here. Um, and there's also the chat. So whether you put your questions or comments into the chat or uh, ask a formal question using the Q&A feature, um, either will work. And I think Rudy will help to monitor those and answer them as needed. Lastly, in the chat, I hope everyone sees that there is a link to our help center, which I'll probably start with that. Um, I'm just gonna repaste it again, just to be sure that anyone who joined later uh, has access to that. Our help center is a good collection of video tutorials and written user guides as well. So this is a great uh, resource that's available um, to everybody, a number of different ways, and it'll kind of show how to uh, access those different avenues um, and where you could find those links uh, within the platform, within the website, and things like that. Okay, so I'll go ahead and I'll jump to the Help Center really quickly right now. Give me one second. Okay. Okay, so this is our site, um, aporto.com. There you can find the Help Center under the Resources section here. Um, if you just hover your mouse there, then click on Help Center, that'll take you to this page. And really quickly, without spending too much time in this, I'll just kind of fly through these sections here, but the most important ones are the, probably the video tutorials, since um, we learn easily by watching stuff. So in this case, um, video tutorials is split into two sections. One is for students. This is really a lot of basic information, like how to log in, um, what you need to get started, what kind of web browsers you, you know we support, things like that. Um, and then all kinds of uh, user tutorial for the basic feature sets that we have. And then below that are also video tutorials for faculty. And these cover a lot of the things that I'll be talking about today, including using the virtual desktop, um, presenting to the students and things like that. And then there are written guides below that as well, which have screenshots and a lot of documentation there. Um, so make sure that you uh, access that and, and take a look. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start and talk about logging in. And what I've got here is one of my um, demo instances. So ultimately, what you guys all have is some kind of landing page. And if you don't know what that is, um, I'm not going to be able to tell you all 200 or so landing pages that we have for each customer. But um, each university or college will have or, or high school will have um, 
a landing page and typically it's something that you're already familiar with so usually you like my university name dot usually it's something along those lines so if you haven't had access to that make sure to contact your um, i guess it admin and they'll be able to give you that information so in most cases what you'll see when you do access your instances there will there will just be a login button and once the user clicks on that that's going to redirect you to um, your single sign-on experience, whether that's through Microsoft or other providers. So that's usually integrated in that way. And you'd be able to um, log into the environment as you normally would uh, using single sign-on. And once you are there, that'll take you to the next section, which is the App Store. Um, so I'll show you that in a minute. And then another thing I wanted to show was logging in through Canvas. Give me one second, I'll pull that up. So this will be pretty familiar to you already. Um, if you guys have Canvas, if not, you have you might have Blackboard or Moodle um, or Sakai or Brightspace, D2L and so forth. And we support all of those as well. Um, so those are really good integrations and I'll show you why. And so logging in like you normally would as a student or faculty here, in this case, I'm logged in as a student. Um, but ultimately, I have, in this case, just a single course. I have some assignments. And when I click on that course, I'm able to access either an app store, maybe a specific application that we haven't configured in this demo, um, or in this case, a direct desktop. So I'll show you guys what that looks like in a minute um, once we get a little bit further into that presentation. And so what I'm going to do is kind of split my screen into two sections. And what we'll have really is a, is a view of, um, of two areas. I'll be looking at a student side and a faculty side. So I wanna make sure that there's an understanding of which one is which. So on the left-hand side, I'll go ahead and log in as a student. And on the right-hand side, I'll log in as a faculty member. And we'll kind of start looking at what those two different perspectives look like. Thankfully, none of you have to deal with these captures, but I do. Okay, so what we have here, uh, let me take a look at the student side. So what we're looking at in this case is I'm logged in as a student. I have this app store and the collection of the environments and applications that I have access to are really just dependent on how I've accessed the environment. And what that really means is in some cases, if you access it from your learning management system like Canvas, that group and the course groups are already automatically passed to a Porto. And so the app store is configured to, to, to show the student um, or users what they have access to based on the courses they're taking uh, or the course that they're launching the environment from. And if there is no learning management system integration, then there's single sign-on. And in that case, it's all dependent on how it's configured by your IT admin. Maybe um, everyone gets access to everything in the app store. Maybe other students get access to restricted applications based on a group that they're a member of and things like that. So that's really what we're looking at here. We could either launch individual applications or we can launch uh, direct full desktops. So that's what I'll be doing here. So I'll go ahead and launch the uh, Windows virtual desktop that we've set up. Okay. So that's loaded up and expand my screen share a little bit. Okay. So a couple of things I wanted to point out. I mentioned before that the Help Center is accessible through a various, uh, 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 a couple different links. So if we go back to the App Store and we click on the Help section here, in most cases, um, the user guide or the Help Center is present there. And another area the Help Center is present is within the virtual desktop, within uh, the uh, portal toolbar, which is this gray bar at the top with uh, a number of features and buttons. So the help button at the top right will show us 
um, access to the video tutorials and also the user guide. So there's a couple different ways you can access that help center. And I think this is really important to let your students know. Um, also for support reasons, if a student has an issue logging in or maybe they're having a problem with an application, um, we do not really turn around support requests. So we're happy to help uh, no matter what. And so in this case, um, if I'm a student and I'm already within a virtual desktop and I'm having some kind of issue, I can go ahead and click on this and that'll open us up and take us here to the uh, support section of the site. So really important to note that. Um, that's also, I believe, available here. But in some cases, um, university admins who are managing this environment for the school might have um, replaced this link with a different one, maybe your own internal IT support help desk, uh, something along those lines. But in most cases, um, we have a support request uh, button here as well. OK. So we looked at logging in a little bit. We talked a little bit about App Store access, and now we'll discuss um, file handling and file recovery. So as you folks know, um, I'm in the virtual desktop here, and now I can go ahead and start working with my applications and working with uh, whatever I need. So it is a virtual desktop. It does have outgoing internet access as well. So this is enabled by default. Um, and the reason for that is because it kind of makes sense to you know access the internet from within a virtual desktop even though you're using a browser to access the environment in the first place and one thing i want to mention too is that the chrome browser is our recommended browser of use or, or you, we recommend that you use that browser to access the environment but we do also support edge and firefox and safari um, and, and pretty much anything else that supports HTML5. And because of that, that makes this environment completely device agnostic, meaning that if something has a web browser and it's capable of HTML5, it should probably work accessing this virtual desktop. So I could access this from an iPad. I could access this from a Chromebook. I could access this from, I don't know, my grandpa's old compact laptop. Um, pretty much anything that can run an HTML5 capable browser should work. I can even access this for my cell phone, Android, iOS, and so forth. Um, so I'm going to fly through a little bit of these buttons, but really I want to focus on file handling. Um, another important piece to mention is that we have a full screen mode. And so right now, if I expand my screen share a little bit, you'll see that I've got now I've got two taskbars. Um, in this case, I'm running a Windows 10 machine. I've got my browser open. Um, if I hit the Windows key, I actually have a pop-up from the virtual desktop start menu, but I also have a pop-up from my physical machine on another monitor. And so if I put um, full screen mode on, what that's going to do is start capturing um, all of the key presses that I'm setting, including sophisticated or complex keyboard shortcuts and combinations. So if I'm working in something like Photoshop or if I'm working in SolidWorks or any other type of application that has kind of like a unique set of key combinations, those will be captured in full screen mode. If you're not in full screen mode, we're only able to capture a limited number or limited types of key presses. Um, so that's really important to know. So if anybody has um, any comments about that or has any issues in regards to specifically using applications that have you know four or five key combinations and they say they don't work, they should work on the on the uh, in, when you're in full screen mode. Another thing to note is that if you are a Mac user and you're connecting from a Mac um, OS X uh, OS and that those combinations will work as well, but you have to keep in mind that Windows you know, in this case, I'm connected to a Windows machine or Windows OS. So things like copy and paste are a little bit different. This is something that we document in our help center where we talk about copying and pasting. Um, so it's pretty important to understand that, you know, command and control are, are a thing between OS X and Windows. So it's important to, uh, to keep that in mind that, you know, command V is not going to paste into Windows, but control V will. Um, so you have to know that if you're using a Mac keyboard to just keep in mind that the control keys and command keys are kind of um, swapped in a way. Uh, so we do document that. But same idea, that if you're using a Mac and you're on Chrome or whatever the case is, you put it in a full screen, we should be able to capture all those key combinations. 
Okay, so file upload and file download. So um, user profiles are persistent within this environment. And what really that means um, is that if we open up a folder here and take a look under quick access or this PC, um, in this case, I'm connected to a Windows OS, but we also support Linux distributions and Mac OS in, in the cloud. Um, in this case, I'm in Windows. And so um, anything I save to the desktop, anything I save to the downloads or uh, documents, these, these three areas are completely um, persistent to my user. So that means if I sign out today and log in two months from now back to this desktop or even a different desktop, perhaps I'm logging into an Ubuntu Linux virtual desktop, I will still have the same files that I saved to any of these three folders from several months ago uh, when I log back in later. So they're persistent in that sense that if I create a file on desktop, it's going to be retained here for forever until I'm you know, deleted out of this portal or something along those lines. So that's important to know. Um, another thing about file handling is that if you click the upload button, it'll pull up your um, file explorer. From there, you can select your files and click uh, upload. Those will automatically be uploaded to the virtual desktop. So this folder, if you need to download files from the virtual machine back down to your physical computer, by default, it's going to assume you're, what you're trying to get files from the desktop folder. But if you want to back up and look at your other areas like documents and downloads, you could do that. And then you can select your files and download them. Those will be downloaded to the virtual, uh, to your physical browser, right? So the browser downloads folder to uh, that's configured for the browser that you're using to connect from. Next, we had a question about app data. And this is a usual question we, we, we do get about if app data is one of those persistent folders yep. and it is and isn't. <clears throat> we do have configurations, certain configurations that we, um, that we configure uh, according to your environment. So not everything is copied in app data, but we do go through the applications that your environment uh, has and we will um, manually configure that to save some of the data that, that is needed for these applications. Yeah, that's a really good question. In most cases, so app data or certain aspects of app data are captured and persistent. Um, so I guess if you want to consider that as like a fourth area that's that's persistent, that is uh, in most cases a persistent area. Now we have default templates that are kind of applied to capture things like office um, logins and stuff like that, or maybe some settings for SolidWorks and a couple other applications, most common apps, especially things like Chrome. Um, but if there's something that you're noticing that isn't being captured and stored in app data, so maybe there's an application that users are having to reset a lot or reconfigure, um, just let us know. You know, contact success at aporta.com, support at aporta.com. Um, just tell us who you are, which application you want to see more persistence for, and we can go ahead and apply those profiles to, to make those areas more persistent. But in most cases, most applications should have uh, a persistent setting experience. Yeah, that was a really good question. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Max. Yeah, sure thing. Okay, another thing I wanna show um, is that we support drag and drop, but it's only going to drop things into the desktop area. So if I take this file here, drag it into my desktop, that's gonna go ahead and upload it in a second, and it's going to be uploaded directly to the desktops specifically. Um, so that's to say that, you know, you're not going to be able to drag a file into like documents, for example, from your physical machine. It's always going to choose the desktop as the default. Um, let me talk a little about, uh, a little a bit about um, the clipboard. So we also support um, color and things like that. So if you paste uh, or if you copy an image, from something on your physical machine and then paste it into the virtual desktop. We're able to capture that data and paste that into you know, Paint or whatever, uh, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, things like that. So those, so images can be copied and pasted as well. And so is text. So you should be able to uh, copy and paste back and forth. All right, so we talked a little bit about um, file uploads and how that works. Let me also mention, I think someone's asking a question that's 
that's a great question. Yeah, so let me let me cover that too before I jump to my next section here. So we have um, a in-house application called Portal Cloud Mounter, and ultimately what this does is allow you to mount um, any of these drive types to the virtual desktop. And the way that this works is um, once you click on one of these, for example, OneDrive, by default, this checkbox is checked. And as long as the user does not uncheck this box, like I just did, then once you connect your OneDrive here, it will go ahead and remount that drive every time you log in. Um, and that remounting of the drive will continue and be persistent for any of the Windows virtual desktops that the user logs into. So if maybe your um, organization has a GPU enabled desktop or a non-GPU enabled desktop or other types of various Windows desktops, um, no matter which one of those the user logs into, the OneDrive um, connection will always reconnect as long as you leave that checkbox checked. And the way that this works is it creates a, uh, a drive. So basically like a network drive. Um, in this case, it'll be drive O and that's where um, you'll see all of your files. And what we typically recommend is that even though you can support um, or opening files directly from the OneDrive connection here using Cloud Mounter does work. There's a little bit of a bottleneck sometimes, especially because we're using the APIs native to OneDrive. And what they tend to do with those is they pre-scan the files that you're working with and there's a little bit of throttling involved. So what we recommend, and um, if you connect the drive, you'll get a pop-up warning you about this. What we recommend is that once you mount a cloud drive, you'd want to take the project file that you're working on and copy down to the local virtual machine first. Uh, for a number of reasons, we have high-speed SSD in the cloud, so really fast uh, disk. And what that'll allow you to do is just work with that file directly within the same system. It's just faster. And then once you're done, you can just kind of drag it back or save it back to the OneDrive connection. Um, so we can support all of these at once. So Google Drive, OneDrive, Box Drive, and Dropbox. Um, so all four could be mounted at once. And if your university or, or organization has configured some kind of file server connection to uh, the portal virtual desktops, then those could be supported as well. And that's what these are. So like file servers or SMB shares could be connectable. But in most cases, that has to be confirmed with your IT admin because that has to be pre-configured ahead of time. That, that That's a perfect segue into the uh, course folders, shared folders, Max? Ah, uh, yes. So if your um, IT Porto admin has enabled this feature, what these are are basically, let's see if I've got this one set up. Yeah, I did. Um, ultimately, what we can do is we can create a shared folder for a group or a class um, or whatever the case is. So in this case, I'm a student who is taking a Math 101 course and maybe a couple other courses, so I see these as well. But in my case, I'm working with Math 101. And what this could be is a central repository that the faculty could access and modify. And by default, if we set this up, what it is is pretty much a, a central SharePoint type of approach where you've got um, in here, you could, you know, create project folders, um, faculty could upload a syllabus or project files, maybe templates or something along those lines that they want their students to have access to. Um, and this is really helpful. And I think a lot of uh, customers are starting to use this quite a bit. But that's kind of the idea that faculty and we can configure it such that faculty have full control over this folder. They could create subfolders. They could, you know, upload files there as much as they'd like. Um, whereas students have only read read only access. So they would be able to um, basically make copies of those project files or open them, but not be able to modify them. And we have a few schools who have um, taken the extra step to kind of get a folder created for each student so that they could upload their homework there. Um, other students can't see or access those folders, but the faculty can. So we could do some pretty neat, tricky stuff like that, but I think it's a very good feature to, to have there. Okay, let me jump back to a quick thing I wanted to cover. So file recovery. Um, as you can see, we have, uh, let me delete this one. So as you can see, we have the recycle bin, um, but let's say that, you know, I deleted that permanently 
And um, I don't know if it's been long enough, but we'll see. I'll give it a try. So if you delete a file permanently, um, there are other ways that we could restore it for you. But each student and faculty alike also have their own access to what we call shadow copies. And hopefully I've got these set up on this environment. Yeah, I haven't had a restore point yet because I haven't been logged in long enough. So what this is, is um, let's say that we created uh, files or folders within the desktop, downloads or documents. These are all persistent redirected areas. So these are mounted profiles that are persistent for users. And what students can do is if they kind of go really far, they delete some folders by accident, there will be hourly backups listed here. And what it is, um, you know, we could right click on desktop, go to properties and then go to previous versions. That'll bring up this window and we'll see hourly restore points. From there, a student can cl uh, click on one of those folders. So basically it will be a bunch of desktop folders here and each one will be an hourly backed up time point. They could select the one that they're looking for, maybe from two hours ago or you know three days ago or something along those lines. And they could either restore the entire desktop folder or they could open it up. So basically open up that version of that desktop folder from an hour ago or two hours ago. And from there, they could browse the specific file or files that they're looking for, or maybe ones that they deleted, or maybe they overwrote it, something along those lines. And they could take that file and they just drag it back to where they want it, or they could copy it out. Um, and same goes for subfolders. So for example, if I had a folder that I created on the desktop or somewhere in documents, um, I could do the same thing with that subfolder. So I could just right click on that folder and same idea, I can go back to previous versions, find the restore point I'm looking for, maybe open up that uh, uh, save point and then copy those files out. So that's really important. Um, I think it's really useful. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure that we documented that on our help center, I have to double check, but if not, we'll add it for sure because I think this is a really important feature. Now, there's another way to restore files. It's a little bit um, a little bit more kind of uh, wholesome, I guess, but we can create restore points here. So clicking this button will allow you to, um, and, and this part is documented for sure, clicking the uh, snapshot button, what it'll do is it'll allow the student uh, to capture a state of all of their files, no matter which folders they're in. So that covers the downloads, desktop documents, all the subfolders that they have. We take one big snapshot of that exact time point. And the idea behind that feature is pretty much, you know, if a student is going to work on a big project and they just want to get a nice backup of everything before they get too far, um, they have a way to restore back to that. So each student is allowed to take two snapshots. So, and those are, those would be listed as dates in the window when you click that button. Uh, but I think the shadow copy previous versions feature is a little bit more specific because it's really granular. Okay. Any questions on that? Ah, restore points on if someone is using OSX. So restore points on OSX would work in a similar way. Um, pretty much that button there is, is usually where that's at. And in some cases, so the way that we do it in OSX is it gets mounted as a home folder. And so it would be accessible um, kind of through through this button. I don't think we have shadow, I don't know if OSX supports shadow copies the way that Windows does. So it'd be a little bit different, but if they take a snapshot, they'd be able to get that kind of um, restore point, I guess, uh, as a whole. I think this is a good time also to mention, Max, while we were you know dealing with folders and files, that there is an option. I don't see it right, currently right now in this environment, but there is an option that your admin can um, uh, uh, turn on and basically a student can um, return a, a homework or something automatically. There would be a button there and then basically they would select that button it would show them all the classes or courses that they're, they're uh, in. Oh yeah, wait, we were on the... And basically, they can return uh, an assignment directly to that uh, to that course. Yep. Let me expand this one. So, 
uh, this is just a quick segue to the LMS feature and then we'll jump back to everything else. Um, so what I'm looking at here is a Canvas dashboard. So in this case, I'm a student. I've, uh, you know, I've got my one engineering course here and I can launch the App Store from Canvas, which I'll do that in a second. What's nice about doing it this way is that it takes me to the App Store view automatically um, or I can launch the specific um, uh, the specific environment that I have access to. So let's say, and, and this is just kind of to show you the two different options. Um, but the idea here is that I've logged into Canvas. I've authenticated through Canvas the one time, and now I don't have to go to the landing page like myuniversity.aporto.com or anything like that. I'm able to access the App Store through Canvas. And in a similar fashion, I'm able to access the Windows um, desktop through Canvas as well. So that's going to go ahead and load up there. And what's cool about this feature is that in this Canvas course, if we look here, my uh, faculty has set up some kind of engineering assignment, right, for my class that I'm taking. And if I go back here, I now have a new button as a student called Assignment Submission. Um, and so this feature is pretty neat. Ultimately, what I do here is I can select whichever uh, assignment I'm, I'm working with that I want to upload my homework to. And once I do that, it opens up the upload file uh, browser here. So I can select that, hit submit, and that's going to take that homework assignment and upload it back to my Canvas. And so the faculty then can log into their Canvas. They could edit their, you know, they could look at their course, they could look at the assignment repository and then review the submitted homework assignments. Now, of course, the student can easily go to, you know, Chrome here, um, go to instructure.com, you know, whatever your Canvas landing page is and stuff like that. And they could, you know, log into Canvas and so forth, or D2L and so forth, and then upload their homework directly that way, but we just make it a little easier. So the idea is they're kind of like a one-click type of solution for that. Okay, let me go back to, all right, let me go back to this virtual desktop where I'm a student. I did want to bring up the U drive as well. And the U drive is ultimately, um, what this is is kind of a symbolic link back to documents. And the reason we created the U drive is to kind of make it easier for students to be able to work with project files. Um, there are some applications, for example, that don't really work too well with how we do our profile redirection um, because, you know, in technical terms, it's some kind of a network path and certain legacy apps or maybe certain um, older applications perhaps don't really like that. And so the idea behind the U drive is that, um, if I create a file here under the U drive and I click on documents, we see that same file there. So it's really the same exact location, but a lot of applications, we're kind of fooling them by giving them a drive letter. And so what I really like recommending is that um, faculty, students, they all save their work to the U drive. It just hits easier. When you're working with an application and you go to save, um, you could just find the U drive really quickly and, you know, create your folder structure there and so forth. But it's really easy to just instruct students to save things to the U drive. And it also eliminates the support needs later on if the student is working with some kind of legacy application and they try to save to like the desktop or some other folder or even documents. Um, you know, I would just say tell them to use the U drive. It's, it's really helpful. Okay, looks like Joseph is asking a really good question. So, uh, the specific URLs to, okay, yeah. So in order for things to show up in Canvas like that, um, my team has to meet with each individual customer and we have to show them how to do the integration. Um, and so the Canvas integration can include individual apps or individual desktops, or in this case, the app store. And so those have to be added by the LMS admin or the Canvas admin at the university. So that's something that, you know, has to be uh, kind of coordinated and, and set up. But in most cases, it's a quick meeting between us and the Canvas admin. Um, once we show them the one time, they, they don't really have to um, contact us for help to do it again. So 
but yeah, in, in short, so yeah, these are deeply linked. We call these deep links, like the Windows desktop, to your a Porto instance. And so those can be configured um, for Canvas or Blackboard and Brightspace and so forth. Okay, I'll go back to the faculty view here. So I'm gonna split my screen now um, in two. Okay. So I've got on the left-hand side, I've got the student view on the right-hand side, I've got my faculty. And as faculty, I have access to a couple more things. So I'm gonna fly through these really, really quickly because I think these are important features to, to cover. Um, if you're faculty and you've got the proper faculty role, um, what you'll have, uh, Actually, I need to sign back in properly, but let me cover the screen really fast. What you'll have is access to the feature settings screen. And the idea behind that is that you can, for example, if I'm teaching math 101, maybe I don't want my students to be able to um, share screens with each other or chat using the messenger and things like that. Or maybe for some reason, I don't want them to be able to copy and paste from their physical computer to the virtual desktop and vice versa. So this is where you can configure some of those features for your class. And maybe you're teaching multiple classes and they're listed here as groups. And from there you could enable or disable whichever features you want uh, for, for each respective class. So that's really important to, to keep that in mind, um, that if you do need to disable certain features, um, so all these buttons at the top, uh, you could do that. Okay, let me go ahead and um, close out of this stuff. All right, any other questions, Rudy? Um, nope, I'm not seeing any right now. Uh, boom, I think we're good. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and log in. Uh, where's the boats? Ooh, this one's tricky. Top right. That boat looks like a toy. Yeah. Tony, these captures. <laughs> well, they, we can't all afford yachts, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about virtual classroom. I think we've covered um, logging in, app store, file handling, file recovery, and we kind of went ahead and covered LMS a little bit. So now let's talk about the virtual classroom feature. So virtual classroom is pretty much a virtualized version of a physical classroom. The um, inspiration behind this feature came from, well, in a way it came from the pandemic. Um, we've had a lot of faculty that, uh, you know, we've talked to and, and they said things like, well, now that you know, campuses are closed and I can't be in the physical lab with my students. I, you know, it's hard to see what they're doing or how they're doing it. Um, I'm not able to kind of tap a student on the shoulder and say, hey, it looks like you need help. So that's kind of the idea behind this feature. So keep in mind, right-hand side, I'm a faculty, left-hand side, I'm a student. And now that I'm logged in, there's a couple of things that I have access to as, as both. So as faculty, I could see um, the students in my Math 101 class. I could see who's online, who's not. As a student, I could also see who's online and who's not, but I could also see who the faculty is. Um, so that's what we have here. And if I had a problem or if I had a question, you know, I could contact the faculty. I could ask them a question. On the right-hand side, you could see up there at the top that I've got a notification notifying me that I've got a missed um, um, message I haven't read yet. And if you saw my other screen, you would see that I got a pop-up from Windows letting me know that I received a message and things like that. So I can click on that. I could see that there's um, somebody reaching out for help. And what's neat here is that if I wanted to call the student directly, I could do that. So this will initiate a um, like a voice over IP call. So you'd have to make sure your microphones are enabled. Um, if the student wanted to ask for help directly through the messenger, they could chat. They could also initiate a screen share with me directly as faculty. So um, if I enable remote control and I hit share screen, the faculty will get a pop-up and um, you know they can accept that if they like. And then that'll open up a separate tab 
And from here, I can see the student screen and be able to manipulate it. Um, so if I'm a student, I'll go ahead and open up some folders and you could see each other's uh, cursors and stuff like that. So, you know, now I can move the student um, windows and interact and kind of help them out. Okay, so that's the direct one-on-one -on -one screen sharing feature there, which is pretty neat. I'll go ahead and close that. Now the student also could have ended that screen share by clicking that button again. And they would have said, you know, do you want to end your screen share? Another way a student can share their screen um, is by generating these share links. And there's three modes here. The first one is view only. So if I hit copy link, take that link and send it to somebody, the recipient of that link does not have to be a member of a Porto or the university, it could be anyone. And uh, what that does is it allows them to open up a tab and see a direct view of what the student is doing. So they could work with somebody like a friend or so forth or another student. Now, that link does expire, and as soon as, soon as the student um, ends the screen share by clicking the button again, or logs out, or disconnects, that link is never accessible again. Um, the second option is view and draw, and ultimately what that does is take a screenshot of the current situation on that screen, and both parties can annotate. And then the third method is uh, full control, like you guys just saw, except that was a one-on-one -on -one type of way to uh, share screens through the chat messenger. Um, this way would be uh, to anybody who receives the link. And in the old days, we used to do demos and kind of share the link with like six people in the chat. And then all of a sudden you'd see six cursors drawing stuff in Photoshop. So it is multi-touch in a way, if you if you think of it that way, multi-input, multi-stylus, you know, whatever the case is. And the same goes um, for all three of these, that the screen sharing, the links, all that stuff, it all expires. Um, so that's kind of one of the ways that you could do screen sharing. Um, the other way that you could see what your students are up to is by clicking the virtual uh, classroom button. So that's what we have here. So if you look at the tab or at the portal toolbar, we've got this button here and next to that is presenter mode. So when I clicked on that button, it opened up a new tab. And in this tab, I now see um, what students are doing. I have kind of a, uh, a list if you will, or like thumbnails, preview uh, video thumbnails of what the students are up to. So let's say, for example, now let's go ahead and open up our favorite SolidWorks project. I'll let that load up. But you could see that student is my left-hand screen, and you could see that when I close that window, I'll click yes on this, um, that there's a little bit of a delay. There's a little bit of a, a lag, if you will, between the animations. Now, also keep in mind that while I'm watching my classroom, um, I've got the messenger here as well. And if I expand my screen share a little bit, you could see I still have other tabs. So I've got this tab is my faculty virtual desktop. The next tab is my virtual classroom. And then both, I still have access to the messenger. So I could see my students and still uh, communicate with them that way. So one thing to note is that <clears throat> I mentioned that there's a little bit of a lag. And I've also mentioned that um, you could see your students listed out here. Now, each page supports about nine thumbnails or nine screen previews. If I'm teaching a class that has 20 or 30 or 40 students, they will all be kind of added in these pages at the bottom. So what's neat about that is that you can kind of flip through the pages. You still have um, all the access to you know, your messenger and uh, features like that. And at the same time, if a student raises their hand like Rudy did, you can see a red outline of that thumbnail. If a student raises their hand from, let's say, page number four, the corresponding page number will start pulsing and you'll get a notification. And so you'll be, you'll be able to see that someone else has a question that you're you know on a different screen or a different page that you're not looking at. Um, so you always know. And now I can, what I could do, and actually let me do this from my screen as well as a student so you guys can see what happens. Now that I see two students have raised their hands, I can click on the handprint there. And that notifies the student that the faculty has acknowledged that you raised your hand, we hear you, um, we'll get back to you in a second. So you see that pop up there for the student. So you have this interaction now that you, know, you couldn't have before during the pandemic, but it also helps with remote students. And there's still a lot of remote classes that are being taught. And so this is a good way to be able to communicate and kind of, you know, virtualize the physical experience of being in a classroom 
Now, if I wanted to kind of take a look at um, what the student is up to, or maybe I could see that, you know, the student is not following along properly, he might need some help, whatever the case is, I can go ahead and click on that video thumbnail. And now I can take a deeper look into what they're up to. I can really see what's going on. And now we see a real time view of what that student is doing. And so there is no lag in this case. This is a real time um, stream. And if I wanted to take it a step further, I could request remote control directly from this view. And in this case, the student is presented with uh, a pop up, you know, asking for permission. They could decline it, accept it. If they accept it, it's just like before what you saw with the screen sharing. Now, as faculty, I'm able to manipulate that student's screen and things like that. And so that's kind of the idea. Um, and then to end that screen control, I can go ahead and click that little X and that kind of stops that process. Okay, so that's virtual classroom. Um, what's another neat feature here is that we've added this recently where you can see the attendance. So you could see who's present, the total count of students um, that are absent or the total count of students that are present. So you know, um, not just visually, you know, from the previews and the names, but you could also see a list of, of your student um, roster and, and you'll know who's there. And so you could also sort that by present or absent. Let me show um, presenter mode. I think this is a really neat feature. So presenter mode is this icon here. And what this allows you to do is present your virtual desktop to the students themselves. So in this case, if you're showing some kind of application and you want to show them a step-by-step -step process of how to do things, you could do that. And when you click this button, it'll pop up this feature. It'll ask which class you're teaching. If I'm teaching more than one, they'll all be listed here. In this case, I'm just teaching uh, Math 101. And it allows you to also broadcast your voice. So if you turn that on, hit uh, share screen, then students will get this pop-up that you'll see on the left in a second. And what that does is it gives them two options of how they want to view your uh, desktop presentation. If I'm a student who has two monitors or more, I can click on new tab and that'll open up a separate tab. Show me that virtual desktop presentation of that faculty in that tab. And I could take that tab and full screen it on my second monitor or, you know, move it to the side somewhere. If I don't have multi monitor, then I can click on in page. And what in page does is create kind of like a picture in picture view. Um, of, of what the presentation is. And so if I'm faculty and I'm showing my students what to do and I'm telling them to, you know, um, watch a Star Wars movie and then make R2D2 and things like that, students can kind of watch that and follow along. And what's cool about this picture in picture view is that you could take this preview, you could take this video feed, you can move it around. Um, they can minimize it. If they want to tuck it out of the way, they could bring it back up again. Another thing they could do is resize it. Obviously, that was really small and it was hard to look at that. Um, things like that. So, and you could see it's a real time view as well. And so, <clears throat> um, being able to resize it, move it around, you know, get rid of it, things like that. Maybe now I'm going to decide, okay, I do want to see it in the second tab. I can close it, click the button at the top as a student, and then I'm presented that option again. So now they can open it up as a separate tab, move it to a different. Uh, um, you know, monitor and things like that. And so it's a pretty cool feature. Um, and, you know, keep in mind that this is not about competing with Zoom or other screen sharing platforms or anything like that. We just want to create a service that has um, a number of features all within the same environment so that you don't have to open up, you know, separate applications and multiple tabs and stuff like that. So it's really just about keeping any, everything uniform in one um, platform uh, to be easy. That's, that's the name of the game. So that's pretty much it for um, virtual classroom and presenter mode. I think these are really neat features. We worked pretty hard on these, and so I think um, they're really useful. Now, to set up virtual classroom, um, really what's required within the Aporto, and this is more for the admins that might be on the call, you have to create a group within Aporto. So that group could be department or school of business, you know, so forth. And you can have a group structure if you need to. So if you want to separate and kind of organize things a little bit so you know what's what, you can create a group structure. 
And then you have to create a faculty role that gives permissions to that specific group or groups. And that's how we can um, see basically classes. Um, so that's that's uh, important. Now, the better way to do it is to utilize the LMS integration. So your Brightspace, Sakai, Moodle, Canvas, Blackboard, those are the integrations that you want to um, take advantage of. They are free. It's not something we charge for, but they do handle the automation that's required to set this up. So the virtual classroom feature in the presenter mode is completely automated, um, you know, through that uh, learning management system integration. So you don't have to create groups. It's all handled automatically. Um, and that really makes it easy for everyone. Okay, so that's it for um, pretty much everything I think I wanted to cover. Let's go to Q&A and see what we've got. Um, looks like a lot of things have been answered. Rudy, what do we have? Um, I think we got all the questions. We had a few questions about, you know, something is our virtual a little bit more like Zoom. I, I got that it is, but we have a lot more options, uh, especially with, the, you know, being able to view all the students, uh, <clears throat> all the students uh, screens, and as well as is there a, a, a way to uh, uh, verbally talk to, to them? And the, there is that phone option there. There we go. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I saw Joseph ask that question. Yeah, it looks like you answered that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you could do it through the messenger and, or you can do it through the virtual classroom. Uh, but I think the messenger, which is available in, in either view. So yeah, you're good on that. All right. Fantastic. Um, let's see if I can quickly. Are there any other faculty? Actually, you know what? Let me jump into the faculty dashboard because that makes sense. Hopefully this was set up long enough for, for it to work for me. And, okay, so the faculty dashboard is another piece that um, faculty have access to. And really what this is, let me expand it a little bit. What this is going to do is it's going to take the classroom that you're teaching, in this case, Math 101, the defined application that you're teaching, and in this case, the Windows desktop is what everyone's working with. And you kind of get a really broad idea, I guess, kind of like a, a rough idea of what the students are up to. And really what we're measuring here is time spent in the environment and the activity that is recorded. And what the, I mean by that is basically user input. Are they moving the mouse? Are they typing things on the keyboard? That's all we're really looking for. Because if you instruct a student to connect to this environment and then log into the you know, desktop and then work with some kind of application, um, they should be in there moving things around and doing something. And so that's really kind of what this is all about. And so we could see the student um, list here and then it kind of plots them and shows how active they are in the environment. Um, you know. If, do they spend a lot of time there and things like that? And there's some per percentiles that are listed and graphed out here. And if you wanted to compare a student um, to the rest of the class, we took Rudy here and plotted him against the rest of the class. Looks like I need to talk to him later because, you know, he's falling behind a little bit, I think. But I think he did well today. <laughs> I try, now, I try. <laughs> if that much information isn't enough, um, what we could also do is generate a report that's a little bit more detailed about, you know, when they logged in, which days, exactly how much time they really spent, you know, by minutes and hours and things like that. Um, and there have been a few cases here and there where folks have reached out to me directly or IT folks have reached out to me and said, hey, we have a student that says, you know, something didn't work out or they couldn't get the homework submitted in time and so forth and the faculty wants to know um, really when and how frequently they logged in and you know we've had to send reports like that and that's fine we're we're happy to do that um there's you know that's not a problem at all hopefully there are no students on this call <laughs> we don't rent you out <laughs> yeah so I think that covers the majority of what we wanted to talk about today. Um, just to recap, we talked about the landing page, the device agnostic approach, um, how to log in, how to handle files, restore files, mount virtual cloud drives or, or cloud drives, um, access uh, learning management systems, 
uh, you know, we show the ability to be able to plug in the app store view or direct environment. Um, you know, that could also be modified to add specific applications to launch like app streaming type, type of approach. Um, we also show the virtual classroom and the presenter mode capabilities, screen sharing, the messenger, um, the communication between one-on-one -on -one and so forth. Uh, we've also shown um, the faculty dashboard here and uh, the feature settings and, and things like that. So I think, I hope we've covered enough. Um, let me put this back on the screen for everyone to see. Um, I just want to make sure everyone's aware that, you know, you guys are more than welcome to contact um, success at aporto.com. That will cover my team, myself, and a few other folks. And if you need any help at all, um, you know, I always like to give credit to the IT department and the IT admins and everything that they're doing to make all of this work. And we're hopefully making their lives a little bit easier by, um, you know, offering these free faculty training sessions. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, we'll be doing two more of these in August. And then from there, it's just a monthly cadence, usually the third or fourth um, Tuesday of every month. So the next session will be August, uh, August 9th, and then again on August 23rd. And you'll have email communications about those. Um, you know, feel free to invite as many faculty as you'd like and as many admin as you'd like. We're just here to help and we want to make sure you guys have a successful start to a healthy um, fall semester and quarter. And with that, uh, we'll go ahead and end the recording from here and get you guys the link and uh, 